Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. My name is Sonia, and I am so pleased to be your host for this Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event today. Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants aims to inspire the next generation by bringing science, exploration, adventure, and conservation into classrooms through virtual live events just like this one. Today, we are so lucky to be joined by Mishak Pierre. Since 2013, Mishak has been involved in field projects in a variety of habitats and is going to talk to us today about his work in Ghana and conservation of its wildlife. Um, we are going to hear from Mishak and then we are going to have the opportunity to um, get some questions, uh, get a little question and answer going with our four classes joining us live and those joining us on YouTube. So thank you so much, everyone. Without further ado, I am going to bring up Mishak. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I guess I should start the presentation. Absolutely. I will pull that right up. Perfect. All right. So I'll be talking briefly about, well, not so briefly, but uh, about protecting my life in Guyana. Um, Actually, funny enough, uh, my very first slide is about Guyana because nobody really knows where Guyana is. Um, but Guyana is actually in South America. Uh, it's not Ghana. Uh, and we have one of the highest percentages of intact forests in the world. Um, we're also one of the only English speaking countries in South America. We're actually the only English speaking country in South America. We're actually a Caribbean country. We're not exactly Latin American. Um, we, you know, we're part of the CARICOM, which is um, the Caribbean community. And we, we have a very diverse population. We have um, lots of races like Indians, Africans, indigenous groups, um, Portuguese. Uh, but a lot of the country's population is skewed on the coast. So about eight to 9% of Ghana lives on about 8% of the land on the coast. And the rest of that is mostly forest. Well, we've got the coast, um, which is where the big city is, Georgetown. That's where I am, where I live. Um, but a lot of my work occurs in the rainforest, um, which is quite beautiful and amazing. Uh, the savanna, which is also wonderful and a very fun place to be. And one of the fun facts about Guyana is that we have the tallest single drop waterfall in the world. It's called Kytro Falls. And you can visit it by plane. Uh, so if you ever do visit Ghana, I recommend going to Kytro Falls. I've been and it's, it's a stunning experience. It's definitely worth your time. Uh, but one of the most important things about Ghana and about my work is uh, working with indigenous communities. We have nine distinct indigenous groups that live on the, you know, when I said we have about eight, nine percent of the population living and about eight percent of the land. The other 11% of the population that lives on the, well, 90% of the land are mostly indigenous groups. And a lot of my work involves working with indigenous communities um, and work, you know, involving communities in decision-making and in conservation. And I'll talk briefly about that. But first, well, we'll talk more about Ghana. Um, it's really important to know that Ghana has what we call a resource extraction dependent economy. Um, to put it simply, it's like Ghana depends a lot on um, extracting stuff from the earth, uh, such as yeah, in true industries like logging, mining, and re most recently, oil. And um, that determines a lot of our economy. So a lot of my work involves um, figuring out how to have those activities and conserve wildlife at the same time. And it's quite, it's a bit challenging, but what's good is that at least our government recognizes the importance of the, um, of the natural ecosystems and the wildlife that we have. And so they were, were willing to work with us um, to figure out how to have these activities and have wildlife at the same time. But let's start with me. Who am I? I am a real Guyanese person. I always like to put that in there because I'm usually the first Guyanese person someone's met. Um, I graduated from the University of Guyana in 2014. And I always used to make the joke that I'm potentially crossed between a homeless person and a biologist. But that's just because I spent a lot of my time in the forest and in, in the savanna, at least before COVID, doing field work 
Although now I'm becoming a sociologist or criminologist because that's what I'm going to study next. But I've been doing field work from about 2013 up till now. Um, a lot of things, I've done various projects. Uh, I guess I'll just go briefly over them. We, this crazy expedition to the top of one of the tallest mountains in Guyana. That was extremely fun, although extremely challenging. Uh, I've also gotten this incredible fellowship called the Winston Cobb Fellowship from Panthera, which allowed me to participate in one of the WWF's World Wildlife Fund's um, biodiversity expeditions, um, where we tried to catalog all of the animals that we could find in a piece of forest that previously wasn't explored or wasn't documented. I've also studied jaguars and mixed land use landscapes, which I'll be talking about today. But I've also participated in the first bird banding projects in Suriname and Guyana, as well as working with marine birds over on the, in the ocean, looking at trying to understand the impacts of oil on their um, conservation, and also human black climate conflict, which I'll talk about as well. So I'll talk about two projects, one looking mostly at animals and the other looking mostly at people. I'll bring this together and talk about why it's important, uh, why I like to study both. So I've done lots of work in different animals, different ecosystems, mostly trail Guyana. So my first ever project was on mannequins. And this is a mannequin right here. Uh, they're extremely beautiful. They're not very big, they're really small. But I don't know if you know about the birds of paradise. They do these incredible dances and displays. They're mostly found in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. Uh, but mannequins are like South America's versions of the birds of paradise. They also do incredible dances at incredible high speeds. And I recommend you look up YouTube video on mannequin dances because it's absolutely incredible. Uh, my first field work opportunity was a bit terrifying. That's me in 2013, quite a while ago. Um, where it's breaking down camp. Uh, we. I sleep mostly, when I'm in the field, I sleep mostly in hammocks, um, which I honestly quite enjoy. But my first night in a hammock was terrifying, just because like I felt like at any moment there might be a jaguar somewhere around the corner or something that might, or a snake, something that might potentially harm me. Now I'm not that afraid of the forest. I actually quite love it. And I know that I've seen a jaguar and they're not as terrifying in person. This is actually quite an amazing experience seeing one. On Upwall, which is another project to do, I work mostly with birds. Um, and this project uh, has students come in from around the world. They come to Guyana and we do research uh, looking at forest monitoring. So we look at, we catalog the birds that we come across and um, that allows us to determine the year in, year out, it's true, different years, the patterns of their populations and make sure that the populations are doing all right um, as time goes on. And this is one of my favorite pictures from Opwall. This is a, uh, I cannot remember the bird. I think this is a black and white hawk eagle. But uh, sometimes we get some really fantastic captures in our nets. And uh, it's usually a lot of fun working for about two months in the forest. So in Panthera, with Panthera, I studied jaguars in a landscape that had logging, mining, and hunting. So we're trying, and we're trying to understand how jaguars and their prey populations respond to these kinds of impacts. And the reason for that is that we believe that a lot of Guyana's uh, landscape might have these types of um, habitats where there is overlapping land use. And it's really important to understand how animals respond to these land use types uh, in order to make policies that ensure that their populations are still around um, for the future. Unlike the off-wall stuff, when I work with jaguars, I actually see very few of them. I've only ever seen one jaguar in my life one puma. Um, we actually use these things called camera traps. A friend of mine has a really good way of explaining camera traps. What he says is like a camera trap is like leaving a person who doesn't ever get tired, who doesn't ever need to eat or sleep, and they look for animals 24-7 for as long as you leave them out until their battery runs out. 
Uh, so camera traps allow us to study animals in their habitat without actually in, you know, uh, going in and collecting them. And that's quite helpful because otherwise it would be near impossible to study things like jaguars. Uh, camera traps also allow us to get really fun, wonderful images of animals in the forest. And I wanted to show you some of them. So this is a what we call a laba. It's actually called a lowland paca. It's one of the biggest rodents in the world, the biggest being the capybara, which is another one that's found in Guyana. Uh, red brocket deer, which is a forest deer. And an ocelot, which is one of the wild cats again. It's a small wild cat, a little bigger than a house cat. And they are quite common in the forest. But when we found when we did the project, we found that we had very few jaguars in that landscape. But this wasn't entirely all bad news because even though we had very few jaguars, we also had lots of species that, well, a few species that are really responsive to impacts. Like they do not like lots of forest impacts. Those are the white-lipped peccary, which is vulnerable. Um, which, uh, their populations are declining around the world, and they're not, we're not really sure why. Uh, we got those in that forest. We got giant armadillo, which is one of the largest species of armadillo in the world, and they're very sensitive to disturbance as well. And giant anteaters, which is the biggest anteater species in the world. They're mostly found in the savanna, but they're also in the forest and they're extremely sensitive to disturbance. And so our results are kind of a bit confusing. While jaguars don't seem to be doing very well in these landscapes, other animals seem to be doing fine. And so uh, we believe that one of the things that may be affecting them is accessibility of the forest. And because roads open the forest for access to other land use types, which is why you have mining occurring on top of logging, and then hunting as well. And, um, but we're not entirely sure why. And so we want to continue studying these landscapes and hopefully piece apart the impacts of the different types of land use on, on wildlife. One other thing that I study, and now I study this a lot more often, is human wildlife conflict. Uh, human wildlife conflict tends to occur when you have um, dangerous species like jaguars, um, crocodiles, elephants, when they occur alongside communities, uh, their impacts on those communities can result in negative attitudes towards those species. And it can make living alongside them really difficult and can sometimes return, um, uh, result in communities attacking animals, uh, which isn't great because we want communities to live alongside wildlife and, and uh, coexist with them. Uh, indigenous communities in Guyana are especially important for wildlife conservation because they live alongside a lot of the wildlife that we want to conserve and they control a lot of the land that is extremely important for that wildlife as they should because they've been here before a lot of us arrived. Um, so determining indigenous communities attitudes towards wildlife and improving those attitudes and behaviors can be extremely critical for conservation. Uh, one of these projects is uh, looking at, that I did, looks at human black caiman conflict. And uh, so how do we live alongside potentially dangerous and sometimes harmful wildlife? Well, the first step is understanding people and understanding people, their needs, what they want and um, what their, views on wildlife are. This is super important because their views can determine their behaviors, which determines how they um, coexist with wildlife and what that means for conservation. The black caiman, as you can see here, this is one. Um, they're the largest aquatic predator in South America. They're huge. They can grow up to six meters or 20 feet long and uh, they live in the Rupununi, which is a uh, an area of Ghana that I study in the savannah, where a lot of communities are, and a lot of communities exist near rivers, which is where black caiman live in, um, and uh, hunt in. 
So in order to study them, we surveyed communities along rivers in the Rupinini. And what we found is that communities had mostly negative attitudes towards Black Island and past influence, uh, behavior was influenced by fishing impacts and attacks on pets. Um, past, uh, attacks on pets was extremely interesting, but what we think it is is that um, that people lost a lot of hunting animals, like hunting dogs. And so this affected their livelihoods, like their ability to get protein and food. Um, because, you know, if you lose a hunting dog, you lose a lot of your ability to hunt. And so um, that kind of were affecting not only the fish that they were able to catch, but their ability to hunt and gather protein. But one of the good news that we found is that one of the communities in the Rupununi that we studied has a program where they carry tourists to study uh, black caiman. So they catch the black caiman, they bring them up on the sand. It's really fun. I, I've actually done it once where we went with the, um, the rangers and they, they caught a black caiman, measured it, put a tracker on it and released it. And uh, people pay to come and do this. And so the community benefits from the Black Diamond mean, presence. And we've actually found that that community was the most positive towards Black Diamond mean, out of all the communities that we studied. So ecotourism can potentially help Black Diamond mean, conservation. Um, what we need now is to extend those, uh, those benefits, not just to that one community, but to where it's the other communities that live in the region so that more of them can be more positive towards Black Diamond, hopefully. Uh, so we'd like to see more of that going forward. As for me, I am going to be going back to school. I'll be heading to the US this uh, December. And this time I'll be studying criminology, um, but the criminology of um, environmental harm. So I'll still be looking at people I'll still be studying wildlife, but I'll also be um, be looking at be using uh, criminology, uh, criminological theories to apply them to these problems. But I definitely want to continue doing research in both people and animals in Ghana, which is where I'm from, where I love, um, and I love working with the communities down here. And I want to see a lot of them continue to coexist with wildlife into the future and I want to see wildlife conservation be, still be an important thing again going forward. And so that's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening in and I look forward to the questions that you might have. Thank you, Nathan. that was awesome. Thank you for telling us um, all about Guyana and the ecosystem and wildlife there. I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot and I'm sure our classes did too. So um, to our YouTube viewers, let's get some questions in for me, Shock. And I am going to join um, our first class and see if they have a question for you. Hello, Miss Bowers class. How are you guys doing? Good. 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 Do you guys have a question? Not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. I will let you guys think about it, and we will. All right. Let's start with one of the. Let me see our YouTube things. Let's check in with Mr. Hergot's five six class joining us. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you can you hear us? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Okay, we're here. There we go. Perfect. Um, so, I'm curious about poachers and um, like the idea is coexisting right with with uh, with the animals. And one of the solutions is tourism, which is great. Um, but if you're going into criminology and there's issues with animals being poached. Um, how is that being dealt with right now? Well, um, that's a really good question. Um, it's a bit complicated because um, communities, they have different rules about um, how they can interact with their landscape and um, the wildlife that's there. 
it's illegal to kill jaguars, but um, see, uh, I think poaching is really complicated. Um, we don't really call it poaching in Guyana, but um, because it's only very recently that we've actually gotten uh, laws about well, um, well, we have laws, but uh, we recently got a management body that's responsible for managing wildlife in Guyana. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's too many issues with poaching. I think the real issue is um, ensuring that um, that wildlife and animals, sorry, um, that people can aren't taking too much of wildlife from the landscape. So we might lose a jaguar here, or, or um, we might lose red rocket deer, um, but we we want to ensure that um, that there's sustainability in the way that people are using the landscape, um, and that there aren't too many retaliatory killings that occur when there are issues with wildlife. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the question and the answer. Um, I have a question from um, someone in our YouTube audience, and they asked if there are invasive spe species in Guyana. Uh, yes, there are, but it's not really a super huge problem. The invasive species mostly are on the coast, which is where I live, um, and there's uh, they're mostly in the city. So like, we have Indian mongoose that were introduced by the English uh, here, uh, but they haven't gotten into the forest and into the savanna. Uh, so they're not as much of an issue for conservation right now, but, and hopefully not, they're not going to be a big con um, issue. Actually really fun, I, we, we just discovered not too long ago, like I think within the past year or two years, that there are now house finches here in Guyana. Uh, they, they're funny enough seen right next to the U.S. Embassy, but they're still really, you know, really small population and, and they haven't gotten into the forest and into the savannah, so I don't think they're going to be an issue. Thank you. All right. Um, we have some questions from our virtual classes here. Um, Ms. Bowers' class would like to know what your job title is, and maybe you could talk to us a bit about your inspiration to get involved um, in this type of work. Well, that's a really uh, interesting question. It's kind of complicated because I work all sorts of different jobs. Um, I call myself a conservation biologist. Um, I recently was a consultant, um, especially with the marine bird um, projects, but I wear lots of different hats and it's mostly just like calling myself a biologist and doing research and publishing um but yeah and so that's kind of it but once i study criminology and i get into uh the interdisciplinary nature i'll be an interdisciplinary uh human and eco ecological scientist um, and that will be interesting because then that further complicates what do I call myself then? I'm not so sure, um, but we'll see. We'll figure it out. Awesome. All right, we have a question coming from Mr. Shale's grade six virtual class joining us from YouTube. And they asked, um, how do they power the camera traps? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, camera traps are powered by batteries. Uh, so there are batteries inside the camera and it actually lets them go for quite a while. It depends on the model of camera trap, the type of battery that's in there, but um, they'll usually last from a, up to a month to, I know I have a friend who does camera trapping and he leaves his camera trap sometimes up to a year. And so it can last a really long time. Awesome, thank you. Um, I have a question to add to that. Are there any like, do you have any stories or instances where the wildlife has gotten completely in the way of the camera trap or? Oh yeah, um, uh, some animals, it's not so much a problem in Guyana. I have friends who work in, in Africa who have issues with like, um, I can't remember what you call it, like buffalo rubbing against the cameras. But my big issue working in the Rupununi especially are cows. Cows just love to just go 
and brace the camera traps and they'll move them. And I don't know what it is with cows and camera traps. Uh, other times, I think it's sometimes an issue when um, animals, they get too close, so you can't really see what's the animal in the trap. And that can be a bit confusing because then you're like, okay, I don't know what this is. But usually they, they'll they um, keep a distance and it's not so much of an issue. Um, it's really fun actually when animals come to check out the camera traps. Sometimes you'll see like, and it, like jaguars or cats taking a sniff and uh, just they're curious about what exactly it is. Um, but yeah, I'd say the biggest you are usually cows. Cows are uh, cows are a pain sometimes. Thank you. All right, I'm going to check in with Mr. Hergot's class. They um, typed up another question for you, so I'll see if they want to ask that. Hi. Hello. Okay, so well, we have we have an issue that I typed up um, about wild animals being kept as pets, and if that's an issue, um, yeah. Uh, and then we have another one about um, birds and migration. Okay, great. Yeah, I can talk about those. Um, there is actually an issue with um, animals being kept as pets. Um, it's a challenging one because. While it's not great um, sometimes for you know for conservation and animal populations, the the wildlife trade is an important part of livelihoods for lots of communities and and like trappers and and whatnot. And those people technically have a right to use the resources on their land. So it's about like ensuring that not too many animals are taken out to the wild and so that doesn't affect their populations as much. But definitely the wildlife trade is a thing here. Um, um, there are some animals that can't be traded that sometimes are, so the illegal trade can be an issue. But um, it's not so much, uh, it's not pretty huge, although pirates are um, uh, really affected by the wildlife trade and they're heavily traded. Uh, and that's an issue here. People love pirates, um, monkeys. And there's a really interesting case of um, uh, these songbirds that are used in bird racing. And um, those, uh, those, are, those have disappeared from the coast. They're still, they still exist in, in the interior, but the trade uh, affects them pretty hard. Yeah, uh, I can talk more about bird racing. It's um, it's an interesting thing, like where we have um, these people. They keep their birds as pets, and they um, they teach them their songs because they're birds that learn the songs. And when uh, early morning, when they're usually singing, they'll put two males on a stick, and they'll count the number of the specific song notes that the birds make and the first bird to reach 50 notes wins the race and people bet a lot of money on that and although it's not illegal to trade these birds people have been caught trying to um, traffic the birds into the u.s where guyanese immigrants also trade and um, also carry out bird races because they think that the quarantine period will affect their songs so they don't want the birds to be quarantined. And so bird racing can be quite an issue. Uh, but it's interesting. It's one of those things that I may look into in the future once my research allows me to, um, because it'll, it's about balancing and ensuring that people can carry out these activities without heavily impacting animal populations. Thank you for the questions, Mr. Hergot's class. Um, we have a question from one of our grade threes who are joining us, um, and that is, why does Mishak love birds? So is there a reason um, that you like to study birds, um, something particular about them, um, or the way, like their behaviors? Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. I, you know, um, I think my love of birds started because it's the first group I studied. But I don't know really what it is about birds, but I've always found them really fascinating. I think it's that 
I think honestly, it's that you see them a lot, but you don't get to really interact with them because they're always flying, they're always far away. And so I find mist netting really fun and challenging uh, and interesting because um, just you're able to get up close and personal with birds and uh, get to hold one in hand. It's quite an experience, honestly. Uh, if you ever get the chance to go mist netting, I'd say take the opportunity and get the chance to hold a bird because it's it's a really rare thing to be able to do. Other than that, I have to say, like I think the diversity of birds, just there's so many species, they come in so many different shapes, forms, colors, and um, quite a few of them are endemic to the Guyana shield, which is Guyana's part of. And so I find them super interesting, super fascinating to study. Thank you. Um, we have a, another question from our YouTube audience. Um, and they asked, uh, what were you trying to find with your research work and what do you enjoy most about your work in Guyana? Um, I, well, we're trying to find solutions to, to um, well, we're trying to find the reasons behind, um, you know, what's happening with animal populations in Guyana what uh, what's happening on the human side with human attitudes towards conservation and animals and um the end goal is to find solutions to human wildlife coexistence to find to find ways that we can craft policies that ensure that animals are, are going to continue existing in the wild and and solutions to communities needs and their interests so that communities aren't felt don't feel like they're left behind and that we care about animals, but we don't care about them. So um, that's what we study a, a lot of, like our end goal is human wildlife um, uh, coexistence. Um, what I personally enjoy most about research is honestly, like I had this experience when I was flying back from one of my study sites, you know, I felt really happy because doing research allows me to just be really curious like I get to ask questions about things and wonder why and actually be able to study them and hopefully find answers and so that's why I enjoy research because it's like you know being paid to just be interested in something which is which is wonderful thank you we have a, another question from um mr hergoth's class they asked are indigenous people's rights protected enough to allow them to live sustainably in the wild and to harvest sustainable numbers of wildlife um yes i would think so i there are we have laws to protect indigenous communities allow them to um register their land as title bands and those lands have um, specific rules that are different from the rules of, um, of other landscapes. So what's really interesting about Ghana is that all of the land here, well, not all of the land, but most of the land is owned by government. It's only leased out to logging companies and mining companies. But indigenous communities are the only other group that are allowed to own land. Um, and so they're own their land around their communities, lands that they use to hunt and to and to gather resources. They are allowed to register those lands and they have the right to use the resources within that landscape and to protect them. And the village leaders make rules. And what I'll be hopefully studying is how community members um, follow those rules and what, um, um, what motivates them to comply with them uh, or not. And um, yeah. But in, indigenous communities definitely are prioritized here. They're, they're super important. And we want to see them continue to coexist in the landscape and to live sustainably because as communities modernize and their needs change and they're going from you know, subsistence use, which is just for their daily use to like commercial use, so selling wildlife, and selling um, the things they gather from the forest, mm -hmm. we may see issues with them um, sustainably using what they have. But that's why we work with communities. And what we find is that communities themselves are interested in living sustainably because that will ensure that they're able to live in their landscapes far into the future. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from YouTube. Um, and they're asking if you could talk a bit about the impacts of climate change in Guyana, if there are, and if that's causing a disruption to animal habitat or air quality, population growth, et cetera. Um, well, I think climate change is going to be most impactful on the coast because a lot of the coast, like Georgetown, our capital city, is below sea level. And as sea levels rise, as the climate changes and there's more um, or less rainfall, um, we get, we actually just recently flooded the other day when the rain fell a bit too hard and we weren't able to open the gates for the sea because the sea was high at the time. So um, flooding is going to be a huge issue going forward for a lot of us that live on the coast. In the interior, um, climate change definitely has impacts, especially on communities and on wildlife, because um, rainfall and the seasonality that comes with it isn't the same anymore. And so it's harder for people to predict how they're gonna use certain resources and to plan their year's activities, you know, like hunting around a certain time, fishing around a certain time, because it's less predictable now. It's hard to say when the rain will fall, how, how hard it will fall, whether communities will have enough water to last them through the dry season versus the rainy season. And, um, and it's going to be interesting to see how it impacts wildlife populations as well, and hopefully not too negatively, and the spillover effect that will have on communities. Thank you. Okay, well, one final question from Mr. Hergot's class. Um, you had mentioned that you are um, from Guyana and you're studying and doing research in Guyana, and they're wondering if there are enough Guyanese students who go into sciences to do research um, in their own country. That's a great question. Um, I'd say it's it was a lot less, but it's growing now. There's growing interest in doing research and there's there are more resources available. Um, and also as there are more scientists like myself um, going forward, there's more interest from other people who are starting to realize that it's a potential career that they can get involved in. There are also more jobs as there are more, as you know, the Wildlife Commission recently um, open and so they're hiring lots of Guyanese and hopefully um, hopefully we'll see more people going into research. I think the big issue with that is that is the resources that are available. So like grants and funding for research still, there's not a lot of it here, but there is some, but hopefully as the country grows and our economy grows, we will continue to prioritize research um, and you know, make resources so available so that more people can conduct research. But I'd say like, I'd say there are, and um, hopefully there's more, there are more people uh, interested in doing research as, um, as time goes on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today about the work that you've done and your future work. Um, uh, we all wish you the best of luck with that. And um, yeah, thank you so much. This was awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. For having me. Uh, up to five live classes joining and then like eight to ten classes um, joining through YouTube. Um, so this was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you as well. And do you have like uh, social media or anything that students can um, follow or look at for more information about your work and your studies? Yeah, I use uh, Instagram a lot. Um, I do photography, so I post my photos and talk about the research work that goes on behind. And that's just my name, Michat Pierre, Aunt Michat Pierre. Um, I guess I can put it in the chat. Here, I can make a banner right here. And uh, yes, except uh, no C after the- Oh no. Uh, yeah, no worries. It's a common, <laughs> uh, that's a common, uh, spelling of my name.
Well, thank you so much. Um, we learned a lot and thank you for taking the time. I hope everything goes well in your future studies. Great, thank you. Wonderful being here. Yeah, that's it. Awesome. All right. I'm going to bring up Mr. Hergot's class who's still tuning in to wave goodbye, but thank you so much for joining us. Bye. 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 Oops, I was in the way. <laughs>